Hi, Marvin. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Uh, for, for starters, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, to explain to listeners uh, who you are and what you currently do uh, in, your, in your role right now. Well, I have, I have many, uh, let's say, hats right now in my, in, my, in my head, but let's say that currently I am the national organizer of the World Robot Olympiad in Panama. And I, I am also the, the, the chairman or CEO of the um, National Foundation for STEM in Panama that promotes STEM education on, on privileges, how, uh, houses, schools, and students. And also, um, I'm the president of uh, a startup company that uh, has developed some resources also working with BRT. Wow, wow, that's it, hey? Yeah, that's a little bit busy, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, very busy, very busy. Um, now, I was uh, doing a, a dig on your LinkedIn and I saw a quote that I, I thought was really great. Um, it says that you have a dream to teach the children from socially vulnerable areas the skills and abilities necessary to be prepared for the chain for the for, uh, excuse me for the challenges of the 21st century and you want to break the circle of poverty where their families were condemned to live uh, could you expand on this because i think that there's a lot to to talk about in this well basically justin i am a i am the son of an immigrant actually i'm an immigrant as well in panama uh, my mother arrived to Panama uh, when I was one year old with, without nothing, only a baby and, a, and, a, and a, let's say a, a baby and, and the milk and, 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 the, and the diapers. Um, so we entered Panama without nothing, but with a very strong education that my mother has in, the back, in her background um, and social studies. Um, she started to work in Panama and then she provided me an education uh, first, a public uh, public education, let's say from the public sector, official. And um, I take a lot of advantage from this education. And eventually, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to be in one of the best private schools in Panama, which allowed me to have very good uh, uh, studies and allowed me to get a scholarship. And then later on, study um, as an engineer of um, uh, on the, on that, in, in the Panama Maritime International University. And I graduated as a nautical engineer with emphasis on transportation and logistics, and also with a license for, a, uh, for an officer on board a vessel and captain. And that allows me to bring, uh, get from immigrant without nothing to be on a position that allowed me to be getting a salary as an engineer on, on, on very many figures at that time. We we're talking that in 1995, 1997, I was getting about $3,000, $4,000 as a salary, which at that time was very important and, and very attractive. And that was all um, because of education. So I firmly believe that if you provide children on, um, on privileged areas and, and poor communities, and you provide them with education, they will be able to break that circle that were there where the parents are poor, the parents of their parents are poor, and they can break that circle and get out of that uh, with, um, with um, the opportunity to get very good boards. Eventually, uh, that education that I received allowed me to bring uh, and, and build a chip repair company that you become the largest chip repair company from San Diego, California to Talcahuano, Chile. And we make over hundreds of, uh, we made a lot of many millions of dollars during all these years. And, um, and we have over 3,500 employees and I was the founder and CEO because of wow. education. Wow. wow, wow, that's great. I mean, from everything you've told me so far and just from my experience working with you, uh, you sound very entrepreneurial. You sound like you're a go-getter, and you, and you know, you you make things happen. Um, and I wanted to also, you, you sort of mentioned uh, something I was also going to bring up as well. Um, you said that you founded, uh, of course, Panama's largest ship repair and maritime service company. Uh, but you said that you found this, uh, you know, from your room on a laptop, and you grew it to yes. over 1,200 employees. <laughs> uh, so right. you, I I think that you know entrepreneurship is so important, especially in the STEAM community. Um, could you tell us what that was like, you know, growing that just from your small bedroom um, and uh, what advice, if, if any, that you have, um, would you give to, you know, students, uh, you know, children who are wanting to do the same? Well, uh, I can give you a full, a full program just about that, but basically, um, when I started uh, my previous company, which was Marine Engineers Corporation or MEC Chipyards, 
when I started, uh, I was exactly on a room in my room, and I was not sure what I was looking to do. You know, I, I just have uh, came back from the from the oil platforms in Cantarell, Mexico. I was working on the oil platforms as a captain of a tugboat. Um, and then I, I was in Panama and I was looking what like what to do on during this process. Um, and then um, I was not sure what to do, you know. I was like, okay, I have a computer, I have air conditioning in my room, what what I can do? So I started to do uh, as a consultant in consultant company. I become a consultant and people was asking me where what is a consultant? And I was I, I remember I said to them, where a consultant is somebody who knows more than the one who hired him, <laughs> because the one who hired him doesn't know nothing. So they are hired. I was something like 24 years old, something like that. Um, 23, 24 years old. So I started this consultancy company and I started to make valuations of chips, looking into internet, the value of uh, several chips and stuff like that. And I noticed that many ships or vessels or barges or tugboats could get better value if they have a better maintenance or repairs. So I started to recommend my customers say, why well, you don't do this, this repair and this maintenance so you can increase the value of your vessel. And, um, and, and what happens is that there were not many options in Panama to do those services. There were actually two companies only who were doing it. One was a big shipyard and the other was a company at that time more than 30 years old doing a flow repairs, which become my competitor and later on my, my good friend. So they were my competitors at the beginning. And I saw that the customers didn't have a chance. Either they go to the big one or they go to another big one. So I said, you know what? Maybe there is a chance for a small, a small guy coming and trying to do his best on the reverse. Uh, at the time I was working on as a Tugboat Master uh, on a Dutch company, um, which is called Smith Harbor Towish. And I was doing, I was working, uh, the, the process was uh, six days on the vessel and then six days off, six and six, you know? Um, so pretty much I was, um, I was working, bringing vessels into the Panama Canal with the tugboat. And then when I was free, I get this computer in, in my room and start to do all these works. And I start to hire a small gangs of, of welders and, and painters to do some maintenance on those vessels for a more competitive price. Uh, after three years, I have a problem because I was getting you know, as a tugboat master, very good money, but I was making two times that or three times that in the company. So I resigned the, the I resigned the, the company. But before resigning, I take a master's on business administration and finances because I was on the engineering background. And, and for me to understand money, it was important for me to get a clear perspective of a business plan and how to make valuations of company and so on. So I, I, I get into this master de degree for business administration. And it was very funny because I, everything I was studying, I was not studying for a degree. I was studying to apply in my company. And, and that's been one of the most important things I have learned in my life is that when you're studying something, you're not studying for a paper. Actually, I don't know even where are my, my, my diplomas. I, I don't know where they are. Because when I'm learning something, I'm learning something to apply it and to get more knowledge so I can get, I can get some advantage on, on this knowledge. Because knowledge is advantage. So... Um, after a couple of, of, of years working, uh, yeah, already I uh, resigning from the Tugboat company and working on the entrepreneurship a company that I made, Next Shipyards, I start to become bigger and a little bit bigger and bigger every time more. And when I was already making over $11 million a year in, 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 in gross revenue, um, many companies saw us and, and, and they offered us to, to Porsche food because we were very, very attractive. And, to be honest with you, Justin, I didn't need, need to do that. I was in a good company. Uh, some years we make good profit. Some other years we make more profit. Some others we didn't make profit because when you're an entrepreneur and you have your own company, you are uh, on the hands of the market. If the market is doing very well, you are going to do very well. But and So um, I have an option to sell 50% of my company so we could uh, try to get one of the big shipyards in Panama. They, remember I told you there was a big shipyard? Well, that big, big shipyard was in a, in a bidding process for, to, to take over the concession, the administration, because it's a government asset. And, and I was thinking like, okay, going from 11 million, I can get to 60 million. Wow. And I was like, you know, the ambition and everything. So I sell 50% of my company for doing that. 
we get that. I get the 60 million, but it was like one year, 11 million, next year, 20 something, next year, 30 something, next year, 40 something. So I, we grow so fast that there was a lot of problems during that growing, growing pains, uh, organ organizing from having 300, 400 employees to having 3,500 a month was a big exchange and, and, and we have to hire people and get organization. So I spent most of my years as a CEO of the shipyard on the organization and operative area to organize the shipyard. And my big strong background was sales and I was not doing sales. So my advice will be that um, if I have to do it again, I will not sell it. I will continue as I was going. Eventually I will probably get there or get closer. But the important thing I will, I will give as an advice is that you can go after your dreams, but you have to go step by step. Running before walking sometimes is a problem. You can fail and fails when you fail, you can hurt yourself. And I, I received that word. Eventually, I sell my stocks, I sell everything. I, I, I stopped working on the shipyard because it was a very stressful position. I have a, I have a seizure on, on my head. I have a, a stroke, a stroke in my head. Um, um, some uh, blood clot goes into my head and I have to be on the hospital for one week. And then I start rethinking my life. And I, I find out that being on that, uh, pressure on their board of directors with so many requirements and so many um, results uh, made me reconsider my life, especially when, when the other part of the business uh, who were the ones who purchased were not specialists on the business. They were just investors. Um, so I, with that's when I was thinking about that, I started with my wife, uh, Panama STEM Education, which is our startup. And I saw in education, not as a large market as the, as the chief repair, but I saw an opportunity to do something that impact the lives of the children at the same time that we could do a sustainable business. So my advice will be, first of all, you can do everything you want, but you have to walk before we run. That's my will be my advice. advice. I think that's great advice. Uh, yeah, thank you for elaborating on that. Um, you mentioned your background as an, uh, excuse me, uh, your background as an engineer, uh, and then you moved into your MBA. Um, how was your background as an engineer? How, how does that apply in your career today? Do you still take some of the skills that you picked up back then? Uh, do you still apply them to your day-to-day -day work today? Uh, do you still have an engineering mindset that you, that you apply today? Well, Basically, yes, of course, engineering, my engineering background has been uh, the driver of my life. Uh, there was nothing more that, that gives me more satisfaction, even today, that try to solve a problem. When you are involved in a problem, when you're involved in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation that you need to put your mind to, to find a way to do it, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool, and that's what's been driving my, my, my full career. Uh, so there is no way I will, I will recommend everybody. I mean, um, you can get into business, but if you get into engineering first and then you go to business, it's always, a, it's always an asset because the engineering prepared your mind on a setup that you can analyze problems. You can solve the problems in different uh, ways and you can adapt yourself to any industry to where you are going. I started studying nautical engineering and I'm in education right now, but also in, I am in technology. I've been on diving on a, I founded a diving company I founded a chief supply company a shipyard um, been in so many different I have a tugboat I have chips myself I have uh, on a time I have tugboats and barges and I can tell you that the common pattern on all the different areas in my life has been trying to put my engineering setup and, and thinking ways into solve the problems actually every time I try to do something in, in, in whatever we are doing I start with a mind mapping and I start just like that. Okay, let's make a mind mapping. What, I, what I'm trying to think about here and start to put things together so we can have a, like a puzzle all together to find a solution. I, I was reading, I like a lot of music, you know. I, I'm a, a guy that likes music to listen. I'm not good in doing any music. And I was reading about some of the most incredible songs that I like. And, and, and I was fascinated about how people create music is they are just there they like for getting a a, 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 a a guitar and they start to to compose and they have this great music because they have that that on them that they can put together the tones and, and and the music so they can make a melody so it's the same as engineering 
The thing is that you are not getting music, but you are getting problems and you are getting them together to find a solution that is becomes like a melody because it's a solution. Mm. Wow. Um, yeah, no, I never thought about it that way at all. Um, and you actually just, you know, that's a perfect segue into my next question. I was going to ask you uh, about the arts in STEAM. Uh, people forget about the A in uh, S-T-E-A-M usually, and they only think of STEM. But, you know, other than music or, you know, you could even expand on music if you'd like. What role does arts play in, in STEAM and how is that going to change in the next, you know, 10, 15 years? Well, I tell you that, first of all, one of the reasons why arts is not all the time in, on a STEAM view and we are on STEM is because when you have this engineering setup my, mindset, you think very logical, you know, logical sequences, logical. In arts, not, not all the time is logical. Actually, there is math in all the arts. Creativity is not something logical sometimes. It's something that just comes and flows, right? Um, However, one of the areas that I more, most enjoy of my work is when I'm involved with arts. I'm not a very good artist. And you have seen my, my creations in Canva, for instance. What I really like when I start to put things together and I try to pass this uh, engineering mindset to make some logic on colors, to make some logic on the, on the different, um, different designs that I'm trying to do. And, and I really enjoy it. And I can tell you that the more art you put on, on STEM education, the more creativity that you can bring in the, into the equation, the better products that you can develop, the better solutions, but most important, everything in life is, uh, is an exercise of selling. If I want to sell uh, an interview, if I want to sell uh, a, a podcast, you have to put the right colors and the right technology so you make it beautiful because people want wants to first, the first way for somebody to buy something is by their eyes or by their, their, their sense. So if you don't provide something attractive to the sense of the person, either a very good smell if you are selling food or, or very good taste or very good he, uh, listen melody if you are listening or if you are trying to sell something to you, if you don't use the sense and, and, and to do that sale, you, you may not do it. So one way to attract and make the sale is to create, to put, put creativity, to put art, to put uh, beautiful of colors, uh, the way you want to send your message on a very, very easy way with one view, with one side. So I will say that art is so important that I will, I will not put it in the middle of a steam. I will put it first. I will put a steam because art is critical on that. Wow. Oh, that's uh, that's a great idea. I don't know if it would have the same ring as steam, but uh, we could certainly rearrange the acronym if need be. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, you know, you're working on uh, ro uh, robot virtual games right now, and you, you mentioned your work in Canva and how you're doing a lot of marketing for that. Um, you know, and you're in the process of growing it to a lot of countries right now. Uh, what are you learning throughout this journey since you started RVG? Uh, any, any new skills that you've picked up? Any uh, new major insights? Anything that you could share? Well, one of the most important things when I get involved into robotics was that I was more interested on getting children to find solutions to problems than the robotics itself. So uh, first of all, I was one of the Lego distributors in Panama. I was the, the exclusive distributor of Lego for many years. Um, and, and, and we were selling the robots to the schools. However, um, the way the business was made for was to become an intermediate, a middle middleman between the factory and the end user for a sale of a, of, of a product, a very great product for sure, by, by, by the way. EV3 Mindstorms robots are very good. There are other brands right now in the market that are so good and, and equal the EV3 Mindstorms. But when we started, EV3 Mindstorms was like the first uh, starting pioneer of these robotics. So uh, one of the things that more suffocate my inspiration was that because it was an end product you couldn't do add nothing to the product it was already a robot and then pretty much was everything set up and let's say the, the curricula was there um the, the the what you could do was already there 
and there was no this possibility to to use my engineering background, my my love for arts, my creativity, my my inter, inter, uh, entrepreneurship over there. So when we were doing some, we, we created a foundation in Panama, as you, I told you, for, for STEM in uh, unprivileged homes and students and our schools. One of the schools we were uh, trying to, to help was um, on, the, on the natives, on the original people from Panama, uh, one of the tribes of the original natives of Panama or original, uh, uh, call, we call it pueblos originarios. That will be um, original nation, yeah. The, the, and what was uh, named for the Emberawunan. Emberawunan is the name of, uh, of a community original from Panama before Spaniards came to Panama for, for conquer uh, Latin America and, and America's continent. And those, uh, those communities were very poor, are very poor. So we bring robotics there and we were bringing the robotics over there to the schools there. We were in shock when we find out that um, there were other needs on that community, like water, like potable water, like electricity, like internet. And in, in addition to that, they didn't have many teachers. And the teachers are, were not so, let's say, a, a proficient in robotics or, or mathematics or programming or coding because it was something new for them. So here I was with a $600 robot, EVT Maestro, and I have also a teacher that was not, uh, let's say, an expert on robotics. And I was like, man, if, if we really want to get to the major quantity of children around the world, or in Panama at least, we have to find a way to teach robotics without the robot and without an expert teacher. So any teacher in a school can do that. So with this phrase, I mean, this idea about teaching robotics without the robot and without an expert teacher, we start to think about it and, and, and go around and go around an idea. Everybody was thinking I was crazy because, you know, we were the Lego distributors at the time. So our business was to sell robots. And I was telling our people, we are not going to sell more robots. And everybody was like, what? We are going to finish the business. And no, no, we, we have to find a way to do it without the robot and without an expert teacher. And it happens to be that we also have an academy and our teachers were experts. And they were like, what? We are going to be without job. No, 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 no. We will have to find a way so the school don't need us. And they were like, what? You're thinking that the schools are not going to hire us and they are not going to buy from us robotics. So how we are going to pay salaries? They were there asked, you know? And I was like, well, I don't know. But, but we have to find a way to teach robotics because what we want to do is to teach children to think and we want to take them out of poverty. So I don't know how we are going to make the money and I don't, I'm not sure if we are going to make it, but we have to find a way so we can do it in that way. So everybody was thinking in the office I was crazy because I was the boss. Uh, I have a culture in my company that anybody at the company can be against an idea I have. But they have to, they have, they can challenge me, but they have to be, they have to be very logic in the idea if they want to challenge me, you know? So because I only have an idea and everybody challenged me and I didn't have the, the, the idea set up, I couldn't make it the first year. So I was like, man, they are, they, I don't have an argument to fight against them because my arguments are just an idea. And then we get a, a, a grant from Deloitte Digital. Deloitte Digital is one of the most important technology consultant companies in the United States. And they give us um, a, a grant of one week to develop ideas in something real. So we went there with the team and I give Deloitte Digital my idea. I want to teach robotics without a robot and without an expert teacher. So we start to work from seven o'clock in the morning till three, four in the afternoon, then eating and then until say eight, nine o'clock in the night during one week in the countryside of Panama without any TV, without anything, only a beer, food, and thinking. So that's when we, we saw VRT. Um, for many years during the World Road Olympiad, I have seen the VRT booth there, and I actually been there looking at that. But because we were these tutors of level, of, a, of the boxes, uh, you know, you are like, oh, but that's a simulator, you know? But because I'm not, was not interested on selling something, but I was trying to get a solution, I get interested on VRT. And I start to see that, and we start to study the opportunities with VRT, and I was amazed. I, I mean, how 
VRT was a sandbox where you create words, you could create robots, you could create competitions, you could create simulations. You, it was amazing. It was like a Minecraft of robotics, you know? And, um, and I was so amazed about the opportunities, but as any great software, it was not easy to use, you know, because it has, it has so many options. You can change gravity. You can change, uh, you can change the mass of an object. Um, you could do import any kind of crazy robot you have an idea. Uh, so because of so many options, when starting, you were like, okay, where, where do I start? So that's when we connect with the teacher. We say that, okay, if we give the simulator to a teacher that doesn't have the knowledge, it will be like giving him an EV3 milestone box. He will not have an idea how to do it. So how do we get and support a teacher that is not an expert? And that's when, that's when 2019, 2008, 2018, imagine 2018, we start to develop our learning management system to teach robotics through VR Tour Robotic Toolkit. So instead of teaching robotics with a physical robot, we went in 2018 to teach robotics with PRT. And we start to create with our teachers, experts, lesson plans and lesson courses. So any children could study with the help of a tutor or a coach or a math teacher or science teacher. But the most important coding aspects were already recorded. Uh, for any academy of robotics that are there, they know that one of the most, most difficult things is that how to record your classes. If you are doing classes for a teacher, the teachers normally they have like a curricula, writing or something, so they go through the curricula. And I was telling my teachers, no, we are not going to do that any longer. I say, what? No, no, not any longer. Everything is going to be recorded on a video, it's going to be recorded on the LMS, and we are going to go full digital, 2018. And they say, well, what are you talking about? You're crazy. No, no. I say, you don't have arguments this time because we have universities doing that already. You have Coursera. You have so many other learning management systems around the world that are teaching through, through online courses. So this is not new. It's actually, it's going to be someday the way to teach. And everybody was in 2018. So we start to develop our courses about teaching VRT. During 2019, we didn't have much sales of VRT, actually very few, because I was not prepared to sell it because I, VRT was in Spanish, English and I have uh, uh, my, my, most of our country is Spanish speaking and live in America. So we have to first finish the LMS so we could send a package where children can follow the LMS and, teach and, and get the VRT. And we worked one year and a half developing the learning management system. Um, and, and during that time also, we stopped to sell the uh, EV3 milestones in our country. And we focus totally on creating this concept of teaching robotics without a robot and without an expert teacher. Um, and that's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey because um, we have developed leagues, we have developed worlds, we have developed robots, we have developed the World Robot Olympia, the RPG Championship. We, we may meet up and make a team with, with Jorge Hernandez from Robotechnia, with Priyanka, with Team, with Andrew, uh, with so many great people in, in different parts of Cognition, Robotechnia, Panama. Our, our, our teachers become developers. Pedro Pascual, our main developer, he started to stop teaching and start to make full developing. Um, and, and then we have other members of the team that really start to work together, all together. And our teachers that used to be robotics teachers, they, they continue doing robotics, but they focus on creation of content. And they develop amazing content because they were amazing teachers. So all these together start to create something. I was not sure at the beginning what we were creating, you know, and it was going to be success. But I was sure of something, and that was that students with unprivileged, uh, 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 unprivileged students or communities, uh, they have no access to, to robots. They don't have, I mean, and, and in addition to that, even middle class could not afford to purchase a robot for every house. So there was not possible, it was not a sustainable model to have a $600 robot to every house. It was a sustainable model to mix a virtual robotics, an LR management system, and a physical robot, because in that way, you can provide with a couple of robots in their classroom, let's say 10, 15, 20 robots, you can provide the physical experience to the student that they could develop also those other skills, abstract skills on a, on a concrete world. But they could go home and they could have these robotics, virtual robotic worlds where they could do competitions, they could do, uh, they could learn by the learning management system, and they could do so many things. 
So the mix of these two parts, the, the, the virtual world and the physical world was amazing opportunity. So we start to develop that and present that different partners around the world, specifically in Latin America. And, and I'm, I have to be, I, I'm, I'm very, it's very funny because when we start to do that, there were some people that were believers, like the apostles of Jesus Christ that without looking, they were believing. One of them was Jorge Hernandez. He was really believing on this. Um, but others were not so believers, you know? And, and it's been amazing, the journey, because now we have people that they are teaching us that they are going to do more improve, more implementations of, of VRT in their countries than us in Panama. Even so, Panama is one of the most advanced uh, countries in Latin America on, on VRT software. Uh, and I'm very happy because they are all challenging me now that they are going to, to give more students than us and they're going to start because they believe on the concept. And they're making money, but at the same time, they're not only going ma ma making money, but they're changing the life of thousands of children. And, and on a very sustainable and accessible way. They are not making $600. Actually, some of the, of, the, of the partners are making just a couple of dollars per, per, per student, but they are reaching so many students that they have a sustainable mo a model that is growing and growing and growing. And what is, is more important that it doesn't go against the physical robots. It's just a complement, but it's, it's a complement that can go by itself. So if you have the robot, robotics lab in their, in their school, it's perfect. But if you don't have it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't give you a limitation. And then it comes the pandemic, COVID-19. And the whole world was stopped going from schools. Over 800 million children around the world were not able to go to schools and classrooms, especially in Panama and Latin America. At the beginning, people was accepting about virtual and about learning management systems, and everybody was in a frenzy about what to do and what not to do. But after eight months in Panama, at least, and in the Latin America, they start to find out that virtuality and education has come to stay. It's a fact. It's not going to go back because it's, a, it's an incredible, strong, and powerful tool, the, the virtual education. And, and when they already accept that, they start to open the doors to our proposals. And when they saw the accessible, how accessible was our proposal, how easy it was to implement it, uh, how they could do all the classes with a flipped classroom. That means that instead of doing robotics four hours a week on the classroom, they could do one hour, but the other three hours could be with their learning management system at their homes. And, and they could do gamification and they could do tournaments where the students could try what they have learned. So the, the reception has been amazing. I mean, I have never, I can tell you we have, once we make a presentation, a demonstration to a school, 80% of the schools have co converted to the system. And that's something that I tell you, I have sold cheap repairs, cheap buildings, diving services, cheap supplies, houses. Uh, man, I have sold a lot of stuff and I never, never have a conversion of 80% with my, my school customers when they receive these tools. And, and I'm very happy because we start to contact academies in Latin America, small academies. And when they saw that, they saw an option that for them to, to continue operating and doing their services of training. And then we saw some of the academies that were trying to do after school programs at schools, but they were not sure about how to do it virtually. And we gave with this proposal and they are so happy. And man, they are, they are making now, uh, we are helping so many companies in Latin America to continue operating because of these tools that we are not only helping students to, to, to get education of high level, but we are helping also small medium enterprises to continue operating through the pandemic. And they were, they're very happy. I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm part of that together with Priya team, all the team, Andrew, all the people from Formation, Larry, everybody and in Panama STEM, everybody which is working on the on the contents and, and our team, Pedro, Alex, Alejandra, Neida, Sonia, Brittany, everybody that is working on, on all this uh, together and that we're making this, this fit, putting together every part of the package the amazing match that Jorge is doing with Robotechnia for the World Robot Olympiads and, and the RBG Championships is just amazing. And of course, all our team of new members are creating new maps like Nicolas and, and, and all our team is, is amazing. We are very happy about what we have achieved in so short time, but we are more happy that we are helping others to have a sustainable business. And in the same way, they are helping thousands of children in Latin America. Yeah, there's a lot of great people working on on this transformation right now. I think it's amazing as well. Um, yeah, yes. thank you for elaborating on that. Um, I was curious as to your opinion on the future of education. Uh, what does that look like to you? 
uh, how are things going to to change in the next decade? Are they? I mean, you already touched on this a bit. You said that you know they're going to be all digital, um, but but specifically, are there any emerging technologies that you see um, right now that are going to be very big in the next decade? Well, um, one of uh, we all have this question, which are in the education. What is next? What is happening? I found one study um, from one consultancy company, uh, and very interesting. And they are, their forecast is that we are going to have a 16% growing on learning management systems in the coming years. So the, the flipped classroom where the study, where, where the student is learning by a, by a learning management system, I think is going to grow a lot in the coming years. And what we have seen during the last 20 years with Moodle, with universities doing using uh, learning management systems and, 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 and different softwares like Blackboard and all these different softwares for learning management system, they are going to stay and they are going to develop pretty much on that. I think that uh, virtual simulators are part of that. I think we are going to stay with simulators for the, for the coming years on education. Uh, one of the reasons is that it's more efficient to have a simulator running again and again and again and again than using a physical object to do it. You know, and a big, great example of that are the air, aerospace and airplanes. Pilots are trained these days on simulators instead of being trained on, on real airplanes because the real airplanes or physical airplanes are very expensive to run and to, to crash. And when they crash, if you have an accident, they are, they, there is a lot of uh, uh, fatalities and, 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 and damages. So using simulators really cut that and allow the, the, the pilots to learn faster to learn more proficient when they are ready on, the, on their place, they can always oversee what they have learned and, and do it in, in the real life. So I think simulators, learning machine system are for staying and they're going to grow and continue expanding. Um, and I think also it, augmented reality is going to be part of that. I think augmented reality is going to, it's been on the first step, stages. I don't know if you remember that app about Pokemon that everybody was playing on, on their streets. I think that was an incredible uh, social experiment and, and it was a very successful one. I think that uh, augmented reality uh, and automation are going to be uh, the future on the technology on, on many stuff, driving cars and everything. And as the World Economic Forum just have a state on their future of job uh, report 2020, 50% uh, of the people from here 2025 are going to read, read, learn, and re-educate on new skills. And among those skills are uh, programming, technology, and uh, leadership, and many soft skills that are part of that. So I think that improving, getting in, involved in soft skills, entrepreneurship, um, abilities like the 21st century abilities, virtuality, learning management systems, they are all part of an equation with augmented reality that could be the future of education. I 100% agree with you. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I want to be respectful of your schedule, but I had a really great time talking to you today. So I'll just ask you one more question. Uh, if you could get one message out to everyone right now, every teacher, every student, educator, um, what would that be? Well, I would have, if you allow me, three messages. The first okay. message will be for the, the students. Uh, you need to learn to code. Coding is the language of the present. It's no longer the language of the future. It was said by Simon Papert in the 70s at the MIT labs. It was said by Steve Jobs in 1992. It's been said in, in multiple studies, scientific studies. So children, you need to code, not because you are going to become a programmer or a coder, because that teaches you how to think. About teachers, the best way to teach is by problem solving, STEM education, is your way to teach children significant learning so they can really learn and not memorize material. Internet has all the data these days. Google has most of the information already on the planet. So instead of teaching the children about data, teach them about problem solving using the tools of technology that we have today. And I want to send a message to our partners or to all that people over there, which are robotic academies that are going to see that or Lego distributors around the world or any other robotics distributor. Uh, don't look about virtuality as a counterposition to physical robots. It is not. It is a complement to that. 
And you can do a lot of impact in the life of many students and teachers and schools and, and academies in the world if you focus and you discover how amazing virtuality and simulators and especially VRT is. VRT, the elements that we have provided that we are giving for free now with the VRT, we are providing all this work that we have done in the learning management system is free. You don't have to pay for it. So if you get VRT, you get right away the lesson plans that you need to do to learn how to do it. And you have many competitions where you can enjoy and have a, a gaming system, a gamification environment. So try, give you a chance and try VRT environment. Try it. I tell you, you're not going to regret as many other partners around the world. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, would uh, you like to share any social media links, uh, any, any, um, any types of, uh, you know, social media website, anything like that? Well, you can follow us at Robot Virtual Games. Uh, that's our website for the gamification portal that we create for games. Uh, you, we have Robot Virtual Games in YouTube. We have in Twitch. We have in uh, we have uh, Instagram. We have also Steam Virtual, which is our LMS, Steam Virtual, um, which is also available for them. And so they can connect and they can get that when they acquire the VRT. Of course, there is a virtual robotic toolkit social media. And if you want to follow me for some of my thoughts and everything, it's mostly in Spanish, but sometimes I make something in English. Marvin Castillo B. That is Marvin Castillo B. Marvin, like the Martian of, of Unitons. And then Castillo, that's cast, castle in Spanish. And B from my, my, my mother's name, which is Benavides. So Marvin Castillo B. Then you will have uh, the opportunity to follow me on all social media, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and, and any, time, any of social media where you want to follow me. Great. Thank you so much again, once, uh, uh, once again, for coming onto the podcast and, uh, and talking to everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure.